Hi, I'm Simon Lazenby from Sky Sports. I'm here with a legendary film director, Michael Mann. I'm here for yeah. British Esquire, and I want yeah. to talk to you about your forthcoming film. Yeah. I know this has been, Michael, a labour of love for you. Uh, when did you kind of first get interested in this story and the legend of Enzo Ferrari? I first was got interested in Ferrari a long time ago, but I first got interested in this story probably in the middle 90s, where uh, uh, a great friend of mine, the late Sidney Pollack, who was a fantastic film director, and I both uh, got together with Troy Kennedy Martin, who wrote the screenplay. You can like Ferraris, you can drive Ferraris, it doesn't make you make a motion picture about Ferraris. But what happens is that in, the, uh, in one very compressed period, three months of 1957, there's a, a kind of an operatic collision of all the dynamic forces in his life, and it, and because of that little that history, it enabled us to dive deeply behind the inscrutable iconic image of Enzo Ferrari into the true life dramas that were going on. All of us are racers. It's our deadly passion. A terrible joy. He had a second family. He had an illegitimate son, Piero, who I've known for a long time. His son, Dino, who died. Uh, his wife, Lara, discovered the second family. The company's going bankrupt. He rolls the dice on one race, the Mia Emilia, which has unexpected outcomes, both tragic and triumphant. So it's a very operatic, uh, very sensual, very passionate period of his life. And so that's, you know, that opportunity is, is why we, why I got interested in the material, and then every time I considered perhaps abandoning it, I start reading it again, get to page two, and I'd be, <laughs> you know, completely, uh, you know, engrossed all over again. So somehow, one way or another, we're going to get that made. We did. How many iterations of cast and crew did you go through then to get to, to arrive About at this three. final one? Did you? Okay. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> and uh, the problem is, is that no. Two, two problems. One is that the, if I'm going to make Ferrari, it had to be made the right way or not made at all. And it could have been made years ago with a very low-budget independent film, but it would, have, it would have been a fraction of what the film should be. And no car racing movie had ever made money in the history of cinema, so it was difficult to get the financing until Ford Ferrari. And so that made it, that helped, that helped make it, uh, make it viable. And then we also had uh, terrific international pre-sales that also made it viable. And then Italy had a, has a terrific uh, credit, you know, tax credit rebate and all those brought together. From a Formula One perspective, having been involved in the sport now for, for 12 odd years, right. I, I've never seen it like this. Unprecedented mm -hmm. time for Formula One. Um, and, and I wonder how much actually that, that, that helped bring this movie to light, do you think? That, that didn't help us when we put it together, because that, that was about three years ago, but I think it's the, the influence of the Netflix series, F1 Drive sure. to Survive, and just the general excitement, the world getting so much smaller, so whereas those of us who were interested in Formula One knew the worldwide engagement with this phenomenal sport, there's since been a swell and a crushing of a wave of interest in the United States, where now there's three Grand Prix in the U.S., and uh, you know the global viewership is phenomenal. But this is a drama with uh, with very dynamic racing in it, and mm. it's very much it's totally integrated. It's the deep dive into the personal life of Enzo and Lara and Lena and that family situation, and then the lives of the drivers and the racing, and it's all it's uh, the Enzo Ferrari experience. Man. Two objects cannot occupy the same point in space, the same moment in time. The corner races at you. You have perhaps a crisis of identity. Am I a sportsman? Or a competitor? I'm told uh, you have boxes, files of research on this yeah. that you've done over the past 30 years. And as you mentioned, you've, you've got to know Piero Ferrari quite, quite well. Um, Getting into that double life that Enzo Ferrari lived, and now you've made the film, what sort of understanding do you have of, as him, as, as a person? 
as many years as I was preparing it and working on the screenplay with Troy and uh, anticipating doing it, when you actually are making the movie and you're starting in pre-production three months before you start shooting and start shooting, it's absolutely brand new. And so all kinds of things come on stream from uh, letters that, that Enzo wrote in the last two years of Laura's life in the, the middle 70s from her doctor, uh, sitting with Lena Lardy, who was played by Shailene Woodley, his niece, uh, spending a lot of time with Piero and Adam Driver, myself, looking at the diaries that Enzo wrote in 1933. All of that is, is when you're actually making the movie, it's like right now, today, it's immediate, you know? And then living within this living within the uh, this hermetic community of Modena and picking up the osmosis, everything that the Ferrari house is the real Ferrari house. The Storky Opera really is next door. The barbershop really is around the corner. When Adam's getting a shave, he's sitting in the same chair Enzo sat in. He's being, sh the barber is being played by the son of the barber who shaved Enzo. <laughs> the mausoleum is really the family mausoleum. So we enjoyed a lot of a lot of trust, but the um, all of that this is just coincidence. There's 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 an emotional value that fills an actor and fills a director when you're in the authentic place with you know. So it's like with our character Ferrari. He walked down the street and bought flowers at the flower stand from this old guy. Adam's walking the same flower yeah. stand and buying flowers from that old guy's son. Yeah. So there's just a resonance that. Uh, that, that fills things. On the straight and to the tight corner at Nouveaumont, there's only one line through it. Barrow pulls up next to you, challenging. You're even. But two objects cannot occupy the same point in space at the same moment in time. Barrow doesn't lift. The corner races at you. You have perhaps a crisis of identity. Am I a sportsman or a competitor? How will the French think of me if I run Barrow to a tree? You lift, he passes. He won, you lose. Yeah, well, Italy is about family. Ferrari is about family. Yeah. We know that. And I, I was intrigued as well about, um, I suppose, the ghost of Dino, uh, the, the, yeah. the ghost of, of his son that he had with, with Lord Ferrari and how that, I don't know if it precipitated the, the collapse of, of their marriage, but certainly informed a lot about uh, Enzo's character and everything right. that he was having to deal with at the time. Um, have, had you talked to Piero about that and, and you know, that kind of, you know, w what he'd learned about his half-brother? There's many images of Ferrari with people, but there's one image of Ferrari leaning on a car and Dino is next to him and he must be about 18 or 19 and he's pale and sickly, but their bodies are right next to each other. Yeah. It's a familiarity. It's a father-son familiarity that's completely organic. And the, there's a revelatory scene between Lara Penelope Cruz and, and Adam and Enzo. It's very fiery. It's when it's a confrontation after the, she realizes the whole other family that he has that everybody in Modena knew about and she didn't. But in there, there's, there's, there's a declaration by Enzo of everything he did, his belief that he could save his son and that he failed. And it's an extraordinarily powerful scene and a fabulous performance by Adam. Yeah. yeah. You were supposed to save him. You promised me he wouldn't die. The father deluded himself. There were words he said, though, right? I mean, that's when you, when you were researching this film, he, it was like he couldn't fix his son like he'd, he could fix one of his cars. He told himself he would do that mm. and, and wound up knowing more about muscular dystrophy and nephritis than he knew about cars. Yeah. And yeah. It, it comes as a shock to us watching the film. Even though I've, I've had the dialogue for 20 years, it was a shock to actually hear it performed. And, it's, and, and this realization that this man who's moving through life, because Enzo is in the present, moving in the future. He has removed himself from the past. But here's this blast from the, uh, from the past and the trauma, and you understand the, the state of grief that is in. They're both in states of grief, but they're in silos and don't connect, and there's no such thing as this cloying term about healing. There's no healing. You don't heal from the loss of a child. Why Adam Driver? Why did you think he was the, the, the right person to play Enzo? There's a moment in time at the Chateau Marmont when he and I are having a drink and we're talking, and we're just trying to remember what we're talking about, but just the, the uh, intensity of his commitment, his artistic ambition, 
in a man who's lived life, I'm talking about Adam now, and it is just a rock solid commitment to art, to, to the art of acting. And uh, I just felt a bond. I said, inside, this is Enzo Ferrari. I don't care that he's 20 years younger. I don't care that he look, doesn't look like Enzo. Nobody looks like Enzo. <laughs> uh, you know, those are all craft things that we fix. It's what's inside uh, that's, you know, that, that determines that decision. So I, I knew he was Enzo at that moment. <laughs> So what do you think? Uh, there is no ashtray. Are you a prima donna? You ever try flicking ash out of a car at 200 kilometers an hour? I'm offering you a brand new car which has the edge on Maserati. Bullshit. The Maserati is faster, and it has an ashtray. If I put in an ashtray, will you drive it in a mille mille? You, we, we come to him, as you, as you mentioned there, you come to him in, in middle age, really. Uh, and as you said, at this time where everything kind of comes right. comes together. Uh, I'm always fascinated when you, when you go back and you think about racing in the past. The 50s was one of the most dangerous right. decades uh, of all time. And you look at that squad of the Ferrari yeah. drivers that Enzo had assembled and started with the death of, what was it, Eugenio Castellotto in, in, right. in testing. Yeah. Six of those seven, including Wolfgang von Tripps and, and Peter Collins and Mike Hawthorne, died either at a track or in a, right. in a road car. Um, what was it, do you think, that, that made them come back for more, knowing that you know, you're, you're as likely to die as you're not? First of all, you cannot race if you don't believe this is never going to happen to me. And, 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 and the Ferraris were probably better engineered than any other car. They were probably safer and more technologically advanced in every way than any other car. It's just where technology was in 57. It was thought you could not survive and what, every, what drivers feared was being dragged like roadkill along the road. They'd rather be thrown from the vehicle than not. Yeah. And so consequently, no seat belts. And the engines made power. The, the metallurgy, the technology wasn't there in the braking. They still had drum brakes. The tires are not wide, they're narrow. So it requires insane precision. And if it, if one mistake, and the car will get away from you, and this beast will, you know. Somebody said to me that these are all men who were too young to be fighter pilots in that's World right. War II. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a clever quip. I don't know if that's accurate or not, but uh, but they fought for seats in a Ferrari. Yeah. You're a Ferrari nut. You own some Ferraris. Did you yeah. get into any yeah. of these these classic cars, the three three five or the three one five? Were they original cars in, in this? <coughs> no, our, we we built absolutely perfect replicas with uh, based on three D lidar scans of actual cars, and then with a lot of help from the factory to have the mathematics be precise. But the, our cars had to have, uh, they had to be fast. They had to go 140, 150. They had to be reliable, they had to be safe. So we had contemporary drivetrains, tubular chassis that were engineered to take camera mounts through the skin of the car. And then the sheet metal, the cars were finally assembled by Luigi and Rita Campana in, in Modena. And this is people taking big sheets of aluminum and with a hammer and banging them into these yeah. perfect shapes, which the same as they did in the 1940s and 50s. Slow. Oh, they're remarkable. I mean, the, 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 the racing scene. Oh, they're scenes, exact, you can't I mean, tell. You know, yeah, you know. amazing, but also pretty visceral. I mean, there's some very graphic scenes in there. The, you know, the main, the main scene towards the end, um, where the Portago, you know, kills the spectators, etc. It's right, fairly yeah. graphic. Why did he take the decision to make it as as visceral as it was. Uh, I, I start with wanting to know what really happened. What yeah. exact, I mean, in precise, precise detail, what happened? How, what was the damage on the tire? What was the trajectory of the car when it got airborne? And a spectacular guy named Gabriella Lali, who works at Ferrari Classique, where they do restorations of historic cars, which are now you know, extremely valuable race cars, went into the Mantua Prefecture and dug into the files and got the actual police reports. The investigation went on for two years. Yeah. And then from that, we had blueprints of here's where the car got airborne, here's how many feet it traveled, here's where here the telephone pole wow. tore the wires, and here's where it landed in the crowd. Here's exactly how Deportago's 
I'm giving away the end of the movie. Uh, Jack Howard Deeper Tucker's body was found, and what happened to Nelson, the navigator. The most poignant thing was we went to the site of Widazola and looked at the ditch where Di Portago's car ended, and an elderly gentleman came out of the house and uh, asked what we were doing in Italian and through translators. Uh, we, we told him, and he said, I was there. Wow. And I said, you were there? I said, yeah, we were having our family dinner at 3.30 in the afternoon. I was three years old. My older brother was nine. We heard the first cars start to come through because you're only 20 minutes from the finish line, so these are the fastest cars coming through the Ferraris. And my older brother ran out, and I ran out after him, but I was slower because he was a three-year-old toddler. And he got killed. The older brother got killed, and nine or ten of the neighbors. And uh, so from that, I wrote the scene with the family mm -hmm. uh, and the two boys that yeah. ran out. And, and, no, very incre incredibly powerful yeah. scene. I, I mean, I thought, and, and actually, it was the last, the last Mille Mille as it as it as it was because yeah. of of everything that happened that year. It ran from what 1927 to 19, 1957, and I suppose there was the the romance around it. It was it, millions of spectators would turn out, and it was straw bales by the no, side of the road. There was absolutely yeah. no safety yeah. aspect to it. And that, oh, it was a thousand. Well, first of all, the Italians would love to get next to the <laughs> edge of the road as these yeah. cars are going by at 150, 160 <laughs> miles an hour. But also, it's a thousand miles across open roads, through, regardless of the weather, the food to pass. The you know we 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 shot in the uh, we shot in the, in the mountains, through cities and towns, Ravenna, the outskirts of Rome. And, um, you know, in those, whatever the conditions were. So the amount of turns and you, get, you had to memorize, plus they were starting in the dark. Yeah. They were starting at 4 or 5 in the morning. The numbers on the car, at the time the car departs Russia. So if the car is a 531 car, departed at 5.31 a.m. in the morning. So it was an insanely dangerous race. Of course, 57 was the end of the maybe. Yeah, it so. was. You should assign me control of your stock. I have to have all the cards in my hand. Well, half the cards are in my hand. Going back to, to, to Laura Ferrari and, and, and the way that Penelope Cruz, I mean, she brings something incredibly intense, I think, to the, to, to the whole film and it really um, excels herself in it because it's a complicated one, isn't it? She was a, she was a very key part of that jigsaw puzzle within right, Ferrari, yeah. wasn't she? Just, just give us a little bit of background on how important she was to the Ferrari story as a business. Uh, Ferrari meets her in about 1922. She's singing in cabarets, yeah. uh, vivacious. He calls her La Donna Buffa, which means the card. And he says in his autobiography, written years after they you know, kind of parted with, that uh, he fell head over heels in love with her. She pawned his wedding gift to raise the money to build the first car because with a 10% deposit in 1947, they, could, they didn't have any money to buy the rest of the components. And they built the first car within six races, it won the Rome Grand Prix. By 1952, it won the first world championship. And uh, so she was an integral part of it and owned half the uh, equity in the factory. She was an amazingly powerful primal force. and. Um, when she had a when she had a belief, it was total and there was no negotiation. So at one point, she accuses him of being guilty of of, of ignoring Dino's plight and and, and his death, and uh, which of course insane, you know, and it's crazy, and uh, that's part of the part of the heated debate between the two of them. Um, she Penelope and I walked into her bedroom. The actual bedroom was unchanged since she died wow. in 78. And we just, we were uh, rapid taking of breath because this wallpaper and fabric wallpaper, wall, wall covering, it covered all the walls, the furniture, the curtains, everything we had this in it, was, had this crazy pattern to it. And it was almost like she wanted to decorate with something that reminded her of a sort of vivacious, Quality and uh, w w what life had been like when she was when she was younger, and we knew that. She and uh, both of us are so impacted by it. I was going to ask you just finally what you, what you'd think of or what Enzo would think now of Ferrari and modern Formula One. They had a fallow period before between like late nineteen seventies and when Michael Schumacher came good in in two thousand. They've sort of been fifteen years now without a championship. 
Um, what would he do to rally the troops, knowing what you know well, about uh, Enzo? Yeah, yeah. First of all, first it would be very cynical, very <laughs> funny. And there'd be this tough, dark, modern essay sense of humor, I'm sure. I think he'd probably uh, be alarmed at the amount of time these drivers spend in promotion, frankly. <laughs> I mean, Bane know, of our lives. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Um, it'd, be, it'd be interesting to find out. I have no idea, but I know it would be very funny and pithy and dark. He, the title of his autobiography is My Terrible Joy. It's not my joyous life or life is terrible. It's the duality. And that's Enzo Ferrari. Everything was a duality. Yeah. Absolutely. Michael, congratulations on the film. Yeah. Um, real pleasure to talk to you. Thanks so much. It's Thank out you. in uh, cinemas on Boxing Day and uh, on Sky Cinema in the new year.